Okay, let's move on. So we have discussed the Lewis acid and base concept in the context of molecular orbital theory. Uh, and we saw that um, we can get a completely covalent uh, uh, dative bond when the home of the donor has the same energy as the lume of the acceptor. When these energies are somewhat different, then we are getting uh, polar covalent bonds, but when these energies are very different, then we're getting a redox reaction. So um, let us go to a few examples in order to understand this uh, better from a practical perspective. So for example, um, we have here the uh, water molecule. So the water molecule has a HOMO and a LUMO. You see here uh, where it's located in terms of energy and we have well, a calcium atom that has also a HOMO and a LUMO. Um, however, in this case, it would be better to call it the highest um, occupied atomic orbital and the highest unoccupied atomic orbital because we're not having a molecule here, but um, an element. So um, now um, let us decide, well, who is the donor and who is the acceptor? and whether we are getting a redox reaction or a Lewis acid base reaction. So first, who is the donor and who is the acceptor here, this pair? You may unmute yourself to answer the question. Would calcium be the donor? Nobody knows the answer? So you see that the homo of the calcium is higher in energy than the lumo of the water. So we would expect that these two electrons from the calcium getting donated to the water. So that makes the calcium the donor and the water the acceptor. So now will this be a redox reaction or will that be a loose as a base reaction? Well, that depends on that energy difference here. So we do not really have a scale, but uh, we have some chemistry knowledge. So when we add calcium to water, what will happen? What are the reaction products? Oh, wait a moment. I, I have made a mistake. I cannot hear you this way. Okay, so now I can hear you. I'm sorry. So what are the reaction products? Yeah, calcium hydroxide is the product. Okay, so... Um, that means that we have a redox reaction going on. And that means that this energy difference here must be, must be large. Okay. So no lose as a base reaction, but a redox reaction. So these two electrons are getting transferred to the water. And this orbital here is actually an interponding orbital that stabilizes the water molecule and it disintegrates into, into hydrogen and and hydroxide, and that gives gives calcium hydroxide. All right. So now let us look at this pair here, water and chloride. So who will be the donor and who will be the acceptor? Since the energy difference is too small, they are nearly equal for the homo and lumo, I don't think there would be any electron transfer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, when the energy is actually the same between the homo and the lumo, then that's actually the ideal situation for a uh, 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 non-polar uh, non-polar dative bond, OK? 
Okay. So you would actually expect that this C is the donor and this C is the acceptor, and we are getting a bonding molecular over here and an interbonding molecular orbital over there, and these two electrons go into the bonding molecular uh, orbital. So we would actually expect a, a, a Lewis acid base reaction here, or we could expect it. Now, when you add um, a halogenide like chloride into water, um, then, well, you're not really getting any reaction. Let's say we dissolve sodium chloride in water. <coughs> so we're not getting a reaction, but in a halogenide, which is pretty electronegative like uh, chloride, can make uh, hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is actually nothing else but a, a loose acid base reaction between well the halogenide okay, and the and the and the hydrogen of the water. Uh, molecule and uh, this is what what happens here so we're getting um hydrogen bonding in between the chloride and the water and we can view that hydrogen bonding as a loose acid base interaction okay even though we are not really getting a covalent bond or a very weak a very weak covalent interaction we can view the hydrogen bonding also as a very weak covalent interaction Okay, so let's look at another pair, um, the water and the magnesium two plus. So according to um, the uh, highest occupied and highest unoccupied orbitals, what interaction would you expect? So who is the donor and who is the acceptor? Uh, in this case, I would expect the uh, magnesium to accept an electron pair since it looks like it's Lomo is, Lumo is in the lowest relative position. Yeah, so as we see that the Lumo of the magnesium 2 plus is approximately the same energy as the Homo of the water. So that means that the water will be the donor and the magnesium 2 plus will be the acceptor. So the energies are quite similar. So one would expect a fairly convenient bond in between the two. Okay, last but not least, um, let's look at the interaction between fluorine, F2, and H2O. So who will be the donor and who will be the acceptor? Fluorine would be this. I'm sorry. The fluorine will be the acceptor, right? So the lumo of the fluorine has a somewhat lower energy than the homo of the water. So now again, it's it's well the question: what is that real energy difference? So will we still get a uh, Dative covalent bond, or will we get a redox reaction? So we don't know this scale here, but maybe you have the chemical knowledge what happens when you add fluorine gas to water. Do you know what are what the reaction products are? Uh, hydrofluoric acid and something and something else. Yeah, hydrofluoric acid and what else? And OF2, right? OF2. Wow. Yeah, so that means that in this case, the water is getting oxidized, right? Because fluorine is more electronegative in OF2, so the oxygen has, in this case, the oxidation state plus two. So the oxygen has been oxidized. Um, and therefore, we do have a redox, redox reaction in this case. So this energy difference here is too large for don't accept the interaction. The elegance electrons getting completely transferred uh, from the water to the fluid. That means that the water is actually getting oxidized. And the final reaction products 
are H, F, and O of two. All right. Um, then this was basically just the appendix to the last class. So now let's move over to the second acid base theory that we wanted to discuss. And this is the so called hard and soft acid and base theory. Uh, so that sounds a little odd because um, what could be meant by a hard acid and a soft acid? Here, yeah, so to understand this, we first need to think about in more detail what is generally meant by a hard and a soft atom. So we consider uh, a hard uh, atom in a little polarizable atom and a soft atom an easy polarizable atom. So uh, what does polarizability have to do with hardness? So what explains the term? Um, well, an atom has an electron cloud in which you have the electrons delocalized. Okay, so little polarizable means that it's difficult to deform that electron cloud. Okay, and when something is difficult to deform, then that it is hard. Okay, whereas um, if that electron cloud is easy to polarize, um, then it's easy to deform, and then it's soft. Okay, so this is illustrated here. So you have here an unpolarized atom, and you have here your your electron cloud. You see here the negative charge is indicated, and when we apply an external field. Um, to that electron cloud, well, then the electrons will tend to move towards the positive pole. Okay, the more easily they can do that, the more easily that electron cloud deforms, right? and the softer the atom. The harder it is to deform, and the harder it is to polarize the electron cloud, uh, the harder the atom. So, this is where the name comes from. Okay, now then what is a hard and soft acid and what is a hard and soft base well a hard and soft acid is a hard and soft gluous acid which is an electron pair acceptor um, and a hard and soft base is a hard and soft gluous base so a hard and soft electron pair um, donor so in a sense the hard and soft acid base concept is a refinement of the Lewis acid base concept. It uh, uh, we can subclassify the Lewis acid bases as, as hard, soft Lewis acids and bases. So now, what is the use of this? Um, because the hardness and the softness um, can be used to predict um, whether um, Lewis acid base interactions are strong and weak, respectively. And it can also <coughs> make statements about the um, covalency and the ionicity, respectively. So um, we can predict whether we get more likely covalent bond or more likely an ionic bond. And that's very useful from a practical perspective. Okay, <clears throat> so now when do we get um, strong interactions and when do we get weak interactions? So hard, hard interactions are typically strong. And um, in this case, we are getting mostly ionic interactions. So when a hard acid interacts with a hard base, you expect a, st a strong interaction, which is likely ionic. Whereas when you interact a soft acid with a soft base, then you get uh, also a strong interaction, but it's then more likely covalent. Okay, whereas when you interact a uh, hard species with a soft species, then the interactions are generally weak. All right. Um, so now, why are soft soft interactions and hard hard interactions strong, while hard and soft interactions are weak? 
So this leads back to a concept that we have previously discussed in chapter three about molecular orbital theory in context of the um, 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 orbital overlap criterion. And um, generally, um, soft soft interactions are strong because we have um, over orbital overlap between two larger atoms. Okay. Um, so species with uh, large donor and large acceptor atoms are typically soft. And well, if they overlap, they can effectively overlap and that leads to a, a strong interactions. <coughs> okay. While when we have uh, species with small donor and acceptor atoms, and these are both hard, and you may remember that when we have two small orbitals overlap, then they can overlap also effectively, and that leads to a, a strong interaction. All right. So now, um, for cations, a higher positive charge um, leads to a smaller radius and a higher hardness. So this is how we can predict the hardness of an ion. And for anions, when the charge is higher, then the radius is larger and that leads to smaller hardness. Okay. Um, however, if the species is large, then uh, it may still be uh, that the species is hard and not soft. So for instance, cesium plus is still a fairly hard acid, despite it's a very large, very large ion. And that is because um, the cesium plus uh, has no orbitals available for pi bonding. Whereas, for instance, transition metals like copper plus are well, significantly smaller than cesium plus, but because they have d orbitals, they have orbitals available for, uh, for pi bonding, and that leads to increased electron delocalization, which leads to an increased softness. Um, um, the same can also be true for um, anions. So for instance, you may suspect that anions like C and minus um, are, uh, are soft ions, uh, sorry, hard ions, because the donor atom is, well, a small carbon atom. However, in fact, uh, C and minus is a pretty soft base um, because because um, the C and minus ion has a pi orbitals available to make pi bonds with uh, uh, metals, in particular transition metals. Um, the same can also be done for neutral um, bases. For instance, CO is also a soft base when it coordinates to transition. Um, metal ions, the reason is similar while the donor atom, the carbon atom, is small, the CO can make, well, pi interactions with transition metal ions, and for that reason, it's considered to be a soft base. Okay, um, so now to the question, why are soft, soft, and hard, hard interactions strong, and hard, soft interactions weak? Uh, as I said before, that leads back to rule two uh, in our orbital overlap criterion. So when we have two large orbitals overlapping, then that gives a strong interaction. When we have two small orbitals overlapping, that gives a strong interaction. But when we have um, a small and a large orbital overlapping, then the overlap area isn't very big. And so there's a weak interaction. So for that reason, um, we got, get only weekly bonding and weekly interbonding molecular orbitals. The small delta E, whereas for the other two cases, they're getting a large delta E and strongly bonding 
strongly interbonded molecular orbits. All right. Um, so now to the question, why are soft soft interactions mostly covalent and hard hard interactions mostly ionic? So this has to do with the um, energy difference between orbitals. Okay. So when a species is, 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 is small and hard, then the energy difference between its orbitals um, tends to be large. And that's both true for the acid as well as the base. Okay, so now when these energy differences are large, then it's statistically unlikely that the um, energy of the HOMO is similar to the energy of the uh, LUMO of the acceptor. And therefore, it's unlikely um, that we're getting covalent bond, we're getting more likely an ionic bond. Note, however, that this is only a rule, but not a law. It can, of course, be that um, uh, two hard species have uh, a fairly a similar um, um, orbital energy. So, for instance, um, a bone oxygen bond is a fairly covalent bond. Um, even though the B3 plus is actually quite hard species and the O2 minus is also actually quite hard species. So you need to interpret um, that rule with um, caution. It's only statistically more likely that you're getting an ionic uh, interaction, but in an individual case, um, the interaction can still be uh, quite covalent if these um, Orbital energies are, are fairly close. So, however, um, in this, when you have two soft species, <coughs> then in, in in soft species like, for instance, silver plus or iodide minus, the energy difference between the orbitals are tend to be smaller, and therefore, statistically, it's more likely that the um, energy of the HOMO of the donor is similar to the energy of the LUMO of the acceptor. And that favors a more covalent interaction over an ionic interaction. Okay, so that explains why um, um, silver iodide um, is more covalent um, interaction um, rather than. Um, for instance, glutamine oxide. From the standpoint of the hard, soft acid and base concept, of course, you could also view this uh, from different perspectives. For instance, from the perspective of electronegativity, which would give you the same result. Uh, but here we are looking at the interactions from the perspective of the hard and soft acid and base concept. Okay. Um, so let us practice this um, a little bit together. Um, would you consider the following um, basis is hard or soft? So let us look at this series here, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide. So can you tell which of that series should be the hardest base and which of uh, the ions in that series should be the softest base. You may unmute yourself or use the chat function. Um, I would expect the fluoride to be the hardest base since it has the smallest radii maybe, and highest polarity or electronegativity rather. Yeah, so the fluoride is the, the hardest base because it's the smallest ion of that series and the iodide is the softest base. Okay, so in fact, the fluoride ion is actually quite hard 
considered quite hard. The iodide ion is considered to be quite soft, and chloride and bromide are intermediate cases, okay, whereby the bromide would be considered softer than the chloride. Okay, um, now let us look at uh, this series here. Um, water, hydroxide, autominus, um, methoxide, and phenoxide. So generally, uh, would we consider these species, well, to be hard bases or soft bases? I would definitely at least consider the OH minus to be a hard base as well as the O2 minus. Um, the pH, the, uh, the phenyl oxide, I'm not sure since that's quite large. Uh, water I know is amphiprotic, so that can act as a acid or base typically, I think. But the hydroxide and the O2 minus, I would definitely say are hard bases. Yeah, so generally all these species have oxygens as the donor atoms. So that oxygen um, um, atom is certainly one of the smallest um, um, atoms that there is in the periodic table. So that makes uh, these species uh, overall hard. So now then, however, nuances um, depending on, well, to which atoms the oxygen is being bound right and in fact the hardness actually decreases from h2o to oh minus to o2 minus to ch3 or minus to phenoxide and i can explain this i can, I can explain this the following way if you go from h2o to oh minus then you go from a neutral species to a negatively charged species whereby the negative charge of the oxygen. Okay, so when you have an additional electron at the oxygen, then you have additional electron repulsion that tends to increase the, the size of that atom and that leads to a somewhat greater uh, polarizability. Okay, for the same reason, O2 minus is somewhat softer than OH minus because now you have two negative charges at the oxygen, which further increases the um, um, size of the of the oxygen, making it more polarizable. Um, then CH three minus uh, CH three or minus <coughs> is somewhat softer than this, even though we have only uh, one negative charge, and that's because of the positive, and that can be explained by the positive inductive effect of the CH three group, um, and um, the phenoxide is um, softer than uh, the methoxide, even though the, the phenyl group is actually electron withdrawing due to the fact that you can now delocalize the negative charge um, at the oxygen within the phenyl ring. And then you actually have, you have a, 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 a highest occupied molecular orbit in the uh, phenoxide, um, which is which is quite soft. It's actually or not quite soft, but relatively relatively soft because it's relatively polarizable. All right. Um, in the uh, next row, we have um, the NH3, the ammonia molecule, the methyl amine, and the um, phenyl amine, or also called the aniline. Um, so what could be said about the hardness of these species relative to these ones here?
Uh, sorry. I think those, oh, sorry, I, I think those would all be hard as well. Yeah, so see, they are also uh, uh, relatively hard still because the nitrogen donor atom is also a relatively small donor atom, but the nitrogen is actually a little bit larger than the oxygen. Okay, and for that reason, that series uh, is considered uh, somewhat softer than that series here. Okay, so when you have a nitrogen donor atom, um, then that species tends to be somewhat softer in comparison to a, a hard <clears throat> hard donor atom. Um, now, how will the um, hardness uh, change within that series here? Can anybody predict that? Maybe based on the argument that we have discussed for this series, what should be the outcome for this series here? So in all of the cases, the nitrogen still has three bonds but as you move left to right, the nitrogen is getting, is bound to a larger and larger moiety, which could potentially introduce more inductive effects on the nitrogen and therefore change its atomic radii. Yeah, so, so as we go from here to here, we can again argue with a positive inductive effect of the CH3 group relative to the hydrogen. Okay, so that uh, dumps a little bit more electron density on the nitrogen that makes the nitrogen larger and more polarizable. Okay, so here we have actually elect more an electron withdrawing group, the Fermi group, but as I said before, we can actually now delocalize uh, that, that, that electron pair here at the nitrogen, which actually the, the donated electron pair in the in the phenol ring, um, and that makes that electron lone pair more delocalized, and for that reason, it makes it more polarizable. Okay, um, let's go to the next series. H2S, um, an alkyl thiol, alkyl thiol, and uh, thiol ether. So when you look at this series here, relative to, well, these two, which we have discussed, discussed before, what would you um, expect for the softness of that series here? Uh, well, for the sulfur, uh, the radius of the sulfur is uh, larger than the radius for the oxygen, which means uh, the compound uh, contents with sulfur will be less polarous la than the oxygen. And uh, for this side of compound, uh, from the left side to the right side, the size are increased, so it is uh, from the hardest to the soft, so the most soft one. Yes, so the sulfur is an, an, an atom from the third row uh, of the periodic table, so it's actually below the oxygen. So it's uh, significantly larger than the oxygen for that reason, <clears throat> it is significantly um, softer. So whenever have, we have sulfur as a donor atom, then we can consider um, the species as a soft soft species. Now, again, there are some nuances. So this is somewhat harder than uh, this one, which is somewhat harder than this one. And again, we can explain this by inductive effect. So the alcohol groups, they have an inductive effect, positive inductive effect, and they dump more electron density on the sulfur atom, making these two species um, somewhat, somewhat larger. All right, um, then um, what about a phosphine? 
would you consider phosphine a soft base or a hard base? Based on the argument that we used for the CVC. It's probably going to be soft because it's a larger atom like sulfur. Correct. So uh, the sulfur is below <clears throat> the oxygen. Okay. And we said that this leads to a substantial increase of softness. Now the phosphorus is in the paddock tail below the nitrogen and you get the same effect. You get a significant increase in, in softness. So uh, phosphines uh, with a phosphorus uh, donor atom are generally considered soft uh, bases. All right. So last but not least, uh, CO and CN minus. Um, we talked about these previously. Do you consider them hard bases or soft bases? Soft. Soft, correct. So at first glance, you may think it's, it's they're hard because the carbon atoms are the donor atoms, but they are actually able to make pi interactions with uh, loose acids. And for that reason, they are considered, um, or they are actually soft bases. OK, um, <clears throat> so we still have a little bit of time. So we can also discuss a few samples of Lewis acids. Let me just bring up the next PowerPoint presentation here. So um, now we see here a series of Lewis acids. So that's a proton, lithium, sodium, and potassium plus. So would you consider these as um, hard acids or soft acids? And what would be the change of hardness within the series? Um, I would consider them to all be hard acids and the hardest hopefully is the hydrogen ion, then lithium, then sodium, then potassium due to the increase in atomic radii from left to right. That's correct. So, um, I mean, the, the proton and the lithium are certainly, well, pretty, pretty small small ions, um, potassium is already relatively large, but I said before, because there's no possibility for potassium ion to make pi interactions, it's still uh, considered to be a hard acid, but generally the um, hardness decreases from H plus to lithium plus to sodium plus to potassium plus. Good. Um, so now what about this here, beryllium plus, magnesium plus, calcium plus? Are they hard acids or soft acids? Softer than the previous series, but in, in this series, beryllium should be the hardest and calcium should be the uh, soft, softer one. Yeah, so the, the, Hardness should decline from magnesium two plus, uh, from beryllium two plus to magnesium two plus to calcium two plus. However, uh, generally, uh, these are still pretty hard. Okay. Uh, um, and that is because they also cannot make pi bonding because they only have an S valence shell. Um, 
And, and secondly, because they have now two positive charges, which further contracts the ion. Okay. Um, therefore, when you compare, for instance, uh, Elysium plus with Beryllium plus, then because of the higher charge of Beryllium plus, the Beryllium plus is actually the harder acid in comparison to the Elysium plus, and the Magnesium plus is the harder acid in comparison to the Sodium plus. Because the charge of at an ion has a quite strong effect on the ionic radius. So definitely all these three are pretty hard. All right. Um, then what about BF3, BCL3, um, BCH33, and uh, BH3? Any ideas? Um, I think they would be softer than the other series, but still relatively hard because the boron centered is giving up it, it it doesn't have any uh all of its electrons are tied up in it in the three bonds and it itself is is a bit, a bit small so uh yeah. coupled with the low electronegativity i think it would probably still be kind of hard but softer than the others and then increasing in softness from left to right yeah so that that's basically correct so the uh the boron is, is also a fairly small atom, um, but in contrast to the previous species, we do not have actual ions anymore. Okay, um, so therefore, as you as you said, uh, these species are softer in comparison to uh, to these here. Um, um, but they still tend to be hard, except actually the last one, um, which is kind of an exception. So BH three is acts more like a, a soft acid in that attribute to the hydritic character of the of the hydrogen but the other three tend to be on the hard side the bf3 to be the hardest because the boron is bound to the most electronegative atom which is the fluorine then the chlorine is less electronegative than the uh, fluorine so we have well, more electron density on the boron. Then for the CH3 group, we have a positive inductive effect on the boron, which makes the boron even larger. Okay, um, so what about that CVC? Um, iron 2 plus, iron 3 plus, cobalt 2 plus, cobalt 3 plus, sodium 3 plus, iridium 3 plus. So these uh, tend to be kind of intermediate, okay? Um, so um, for iron two plus and iron three plus, we have um, relatively small um, atoms to consider here. Iron is in the um, um, fourth period. So the atom is still relatively small, but because we have transition metals, we have the availability of, of pi bonding. Uh, and for that reason, these species are kind of intermediate, whereby the Fe3 plus should definitely be harder than the Fe2 plus because of the decreased ionic radius due to the positive charge. Okay, for the same reason, the cobalt 3 plus would be um, harder than the cobalt 2 plus. Now, with regard to the rhodium three plus and iridium three plus, we can say definitely that because the rhodium is in the table below the cobalt, this one should be softer than that one, and the iridium three plus should be softer than uh, 
uh, rhodium, rhodium three plus. So now um, rhodium, especially iridium, are fairly um, heavy uh, metals already. Therefore, these two are already more on the softer side, while these here are still, well, on the relatively hard side, but more, uh, more intermediate. Still more intermediate. Okay, so um, now what about titanium four plus and silicon four plus? So generally, when we have ions with a four plus charge or higher, then they are always hard. Uh, and we do not have to think further just because the very high positive charge just contracts the um, ion enormously. Um, so, um, for the last series here, copper <clears throat> plus, cadmium two plus, mercury two plus, palladium plus, and platinum two plus, um, we have all soft ions. So copper, um, it's a relatively light element, but has only a one plus charge, and is a transition metal that can make pi bonding. Um, cadmium has a somewhat higher charge, but is already in the fifth period. And the same um, is true for, for palladium. So therefore, these are already on the pretty soft side. And of course, uh, mercury 2 plus and uh, platinum 2 plus are even softer because mercury is below the cadmium and platinum is located below the palladium. So these are both quite soft species. Okay, um, then I think we can we can stop here and we will continue in the next class with the HSAB concept um, and we will look at the HSAB concept uh, a little bit more from the quantitative perspective. Um, but I see this um, a question about the exam. Yes, yeah, the exam will be um, on the uh, 24th, I believe. So that's the Wednesday in one week. So not the coming Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that. Yeah, it's the 24th. Um, so we will finish up um, the chapter about assets and bases probably on Monday. And I would say that um, this will be um, the last chapter that will be on the exam, because afterward you will start with the actual coordination chemistry, um, which is um, significantly different. And uh, therefore, all that material will then be on the third exam. Uh, but the exam is on the 24th. So it's in oh, one and a half weeks.